businesses can help us uh, be able to appropriately inform. And I, I do appreciate this, and I look forward to the results of the hearing. And I anticipate, Mr. Chairman, an opportunity for us to roll up our sleeves and uh, spend much more time on this in the future. Thank you very much. I thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Shattuck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank you for holding today's hearing on the future of coal under a mandatory cap-and-trade program uh, and the possible te technologies for carbon capture and sequestration. Um, I want to welcome our witnesses and tell you each that I look forward anxiously to your testimony. I have reviewed uh, your written testimony. Uh, I think everyone on this committee understands the important of this importance of this issue. Many of my colleagues who are from coal-producing states uh, like to point out that we have vast resources of coal and that coal has to play a part in our energy future. At the same time, uh, there is a clear need to deal with what I will call the ultimate goal, and that is reducing carbon emissions and using energy more efficiently and productivity, product productively. Um, I think that uh, with regard to a cap-and-trade system, uh, many have already rushed to embrace it as the right solution to this problem. I personally am not convinced of that. I am not convinced that a more uh, transparent solution and a solution that might be able to be implemented on a global basis uh, wouldn't be at least to start with a carbon tax. But put aside the mechanism. The more important thing is to focus on the goal, and that goal is to be able to use the energy we have, including the energy uh, produced by coal, and at the same time reduce carbon emissions. Uh, therefore, I am extremely interested in the testimony of these witnesses regarding the current technology surrounding carbon capture and sequestration, regarding its economic viability, regarding what it will cost to our energy, uh, and regarding um, how soon it can be implemented. I think those are serious questions. Over the August break, I went to uh, Japan to look at nuclear power being developed there, and I also went to China to look at uh, the energy situation there. China brings on, as you know, a new coal-fired power plant uh, every week, roughly a 250-megawatt plant, um, and unfortunately, uh, they are largely without uh, any emissions controls at all, or at least not emissions controls that are currently being used. And they are clearly without uh, any mechanism to capture the carbon which is emitted by those plants. Uh, the technical solutions that we are going to discuss here are vitally important to our future, and I, again, thank the witnesses for their testimony, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the hearing. I thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. First, I want to comment that I I'm uh, heartened by uh, Congressman Sensenmayer's comments of seeing this issue we're talking about today as an economic opportunity. I think this is, is one for us in the United States, and, and I'm encouraged by prospects of it. Um, I, and I look forward to testimony. There's a couple things I hope the witnesses will address. Uh, one, I hope you will address what needs to occur short term to assure that we don't make a mistake of constructing what will just called dirty coal plants now in the next decade and lock ourselves into really, really bad investments, what needs to happen short term, namely in this Congress, to prevent those unwise investments from being made that we will rue in the future? So far, there's some good news that they're not being made because of some good common sense visionary decisions being made not to build those plants <clears throat> in local communities. But I'd like to know your thoughts on that. Second, I hope you will give me, give us your view of what a regulatory structure should look like to regulate uh, all issues regarding CO2 sequestration, including liability, including ownership, including the permitting process. I would very much appreciate your advice about that. How do we think about that? And I'll look forward to it. Um, I learned about clean coal right in this book called Apollo's Fire with another fellow here this last year. And I just want to say that it was an eye-opener because before I wrote the book, I really didn't see a lot of prospects for coal. But now seeing the new technology coming on, it's something we've got to be aware of. And I look forward to your testimony. Thank you. Great. The chair recognizes the uh, uh, gentlelady from Michigan, Ms. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Really, I have no opening statement, but uh, coming from the state of Michigan, you mentioned that the uh, average uh, uh, national average is about 50 percent of our electricity is produced by coal. Actually, in my state of Michigan, it's 68 percent, so I have a, 
a uh, very uh, big interest in the uh, testimony of the witnesses today. I certainly want to uh, thank the chairman for having the hearing, and I look forward to the testimony. Thank you. Great. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you again for holding this hearing. I, along with uh, Congressman Blumenauer, have to leave to attend a Ways and Means uh, hearing, and what Mr. Blumenauer uh, aptly pointed out, our chairman is called the mother of all hearings. And, uh, uh, but uh, this certainly is a, uh, a great um, hearing this morning and an op a great opportunity, I think, as uh, Mr. Sensenbrenner has uh, pointed out. I'm especially uh, glad to see an, uh, an old friend, Mike Morris, here, who headed up Northeast Utilities uh, for so many years and uh, an outstanding CEO. Um, and I uh, truly, you know, am interested in what uh, a number of you have to say about a system of cap and trade. And, uh, Governor, I understand that um, uh, China's foreign minister was recently or, uh, in uh, Wyoming as well talking about uh, coal and echo the sentiments of Mr. Inslee, but I'm equally interested in what you might think about a, uh, a uh, carbon tax uh, specifically put in a trust fund that has an opportunity to focus on a payroll deduction and shifting uh, monies ultimately to the consumers where costs ultimately will be shifted to and focused research and development uh, that could come from that. And especially as we look down the path to dealing with juggernauts like India and China, uh, the, my concern is of one of transparency with a, with a program and the need to have funding uh, as we look down the path of dealing with uh, major uh, countries. I believe uh, China is building a coal plant a day. And that raises uh, some grave concerns and the urgency both for clean coal technology but also a system in which uh, we can have uh, the wherewithal uh, to hopefully steer them towards alternatives that will do less harm to the environment. And I thank the chairman for this opportunity. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Walton. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, too, am looking forward to hearing from the witnesses, especially with regard to this notion of a carbon tax, how high it might be to achieve the kind of results some people seek, the effect that might have on your industries or the consumers, because it seems to me that the consumers are the ones that are going to end up paying it, even if it goes into a trust fund and comes back to them somewhere. My guess is the government's going to take its share out of that. Um, the second is where we are in terms of carbon sequestration. This uh, select committee made a trip to Europe. We looked around at uh, uh, various uh, facilities, some of which are, are trying to make gains in this area. How far out are we on getting uh, affordable and effective carbon sequestration available for uh, coal-fired plants? And at what cost? If there's a cost per kilowatt hour, I'd sure like to know that. Um, and, and certainly uh, this notion of cap and trade. It's one thing to apply to uh, SO2 uh, where we had a, an, an identified number of, of facilities with an identified and effective technology available to do the scrubbing. I'm curious what you do when, uh, when you apply it to carbon and how effective that will be and again at, at what cost. I, I, there was sort of a, uh, I guess, humorous report that came out while we were on uh, uh, congressional district work period, I'm told that four moose belch as much carbon as one car per year. Um, and so this is a, a pervasive problem across uh, the entire globe, and, uh, and we've got to do our part, certainly, but we, I think we have to be thoughtful about it and understand the potential impacts of the decisions we may make here, especially relative to their costs, costs on the economy, costs to the consumers, and uh, whether or not the technology is actually available and whether it will work. Um, and finally, I would say that this has been another um, reckless summer in America's forests and grasslands with unprecedented fires that release enormous amounts of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Catastrophically burned forest releases 100 tons per acre of greenhouse gases and emissions. A healthy green forest sequesters five to six tons per acre. I'd sure like to see this Congress do something about better managing our forests and dealing with the whole issue of deforestation internationally as we let ours burn up here. Um, I've got 
people that have lost their jobs this summer because the mills have closed, because we're at a record low level of harvest off federal forests. Meanwhile, they burn up in their backyards, and sometimes they burn up their backyards. It, enough is enough. This Congress needs to step up and do something about better managing our forests, if you're serious at all about dealing with global climate change and greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I thank the gentleman very much. And and we will be looking at uh, the forest issue, and I think on your recommendation, we might be looking at uh, moose belching offset legislation as well. <laughs> and uh, so those are two good suggestions. Uh, let me turn and recognize the um, gentlelady from California, Ms. Solis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to applaud you also for holding this hearing uh, this morning. Uh, yesterday. Uh, George Shultz, the former Secretary of State under President Reagan, wrote in the Washington Post that our nation and globe is at a golden moment where if we choose wisely, we can improve security and the environment while at the same time continuing economic growth. But we have to address two issues, in my opinion. First, we have to address the use of energy without producing excess greenhouse gases. And then second, we need to address the reduction and threat of national security because of our excessive dependence on oil. Today's hearing, I think, will be a good opportunity to discuss the future of coal in that context and how coal fits in an energy portfolio without producing greenhouse gases. This is going to be a challenge for us. Coal has a high carbon content, and coal-powered fire plants emit twice as much carbon per unit of electricity as natural gas fired plants. In addition, coal-fired power plants are responsible for a number of co-pollutants which are harmful to the health and well-being of many of our constituents. In a district like mine and other communities of color, 5.5 million Latinos live within 15, within 10 miles of a coal-fired power plant, significantly affecting their health outcomes, uh, developing asthma and other respiratory diseases. The potential for as many as 150 new coal-fired power plants in the country is troublesome, especially in vulnerable communities, communities of color who can't defend themselves. So I'm looking at how we can try to address that issue, looking at communities that have been disadvantaged in the past and might be the easiest location to put these power plants, and yet trying to have the government treat these communities uh, with a fair and balanced approach. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing from the witnesses today. And also, as you know, I represent a state that has been very progressive on this issue. In fact, with the passage of AB 32, one of the major uh, legislations that uh, was supported by uh, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger um, is having a tough time making its way uh, through implementation. But I think we can learn a lot from that, and I hope that some of you will address that I know some of our environmental groups have also challenged uh, individual corporations who want to continue with building out these uh, different types of uh, power plants because they will be harmful to many uh, communities of color that are, that are going to be most vulnerable on the so-called food chain. Um, so if you can help address that, that would be very important to me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. Gentlelady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Tennessee. Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses. And uh, as you have heard from everyone, we all are so interested in uh, the carbon emissions, the sequestration, storage, uh, capture technologies, and also the cap and trade system. I do have a couple of points that I'm looking forward to hearing from you on. Uh, first of all, uh, in my list of concerns is implementing a mandatory cap on carbon emissions and the burden that that would place on the American economy. And some estimates that I have read are that the cost of the cap would increase the cost of electricity to the consumer by as much as 45 percent. That is of tremendous concern to us that we would see this type of um, increase. And I can assure you to my constituents in Tennessee and all throughout the Tennessee Valley, this uh, is a point that has not been lost on them. And what we have read is that possibly uh, Americans are not willing to spend that extra $40 a month when you look at uh, trying to stop the release of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Second 
is that carbon capture technology may not be the most effective method to reduce and harness CO2 emissions. Uh, current technology already exists, after all, in an efficient form that enable the industries to harness CO2 for other applications. And some of the reading we have had presented to us on that is really quite interesting and uh, definitely innovative. Some use the technology to recover more oil from wells, and some are using it to capture CO2 from power plants and car fumes to grow algae, which in turn is used to produce biofuels. So uh, I think we're looking forward to hearing your take on that. Um, a couple of the members have uh, referenced the trip we made to Europe to hold some meetings this year and to look at the cap and trade system. And I do have some serious concerns about the system. Um, I've also had several concerns regarding the use of the carbon capture technology. Many are advocating that the federal government buy into the new technology uh, despite what is uh, a tenuous record at best. Um, and I would say that one of the things we learned in Europe during our meetings that is very instructive is that we should look carefully and evaluate very carefully both on the technologies and on the cap and trade system before we leap into this. So we welcome you and we look forward to hearing from you today. Thank you and I yield back. Great. General Lady's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the General Lady from South Dakota, Ms. Herseth Sandlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you and the Ranking Member for uh, this very important hearing and looking forward to the testimony of the witnesses today. Uh, as has already been stated, more than 50 percent of our nation's electricity comes from coal-fired power plants today, and demand for energy continues to rise. So we must find ways to use this abundant domestically produced resource in a way that's economically viable and environmentally sustainable. One way to do that, as has already been uh, mentioned in other opening statements of my colleagues is through capture and sequestration of greenhouse gases that are emitted as coal is burned, most specifically CO2. Uh, as I've indicated to the committee before, the Dakotas, uh, neighbors to the great state of Wyoming, uh, have an impressive uh, story to tell in this regard. Basin Electric is a large electricity generating cooperative headquartered in Bismarck, North Dakota, that serves much of the Northern Plains, including much of South Dakota. The vast majority of their power comes from burning locally mined coal. It also owns a subsidiary, Great Plains Sin Fuels, that turns coal into natural gas. In 1997, another of Basin Electric's subsidiaries, Dakota Gasification Company, agreed to send at least 95 million standard cubic feet of 96 percent carbon dioxide from its Great Plains Sin Fuels plant through a 205-mile wide pipeline to an oil field near Weyburn, Saskatchewan, Canada. Dakota Gas has been successfully capturing a portion of its CO2 emissions and transporting the gas to Canada since some September of 2000. Today, Dakota Gas operates the largest carbon sequestration project in the world. Each day, Dakota Gas ships approximately 115 million standard cubic feet, or 6,000 metric tons of CO2 to Canada. With the addition of another CO2 compressor in 2006, the capacity has been increased to 160 million standard cubic feet, or 8,000 uh, metric tons daily. All told, Approximately 6 million metric tons of CO2 have been sequestered since the project began in October of 2000. The CO2 is expected to be permanently sequestered in the oil reservoir, which is monitored by the International Energy Agency. This successful project indicates that such technology is available and we can make it feasible and economically viable. So I look forward to any uh, thoughts that the witnesses have on that technology and familiarity with that project and other issues related to geologic sequestration or other beneficial industrial uses of these gases. And also looking forward to continuing to share the opportunities that the Dakotas have seized uh, as we deal with the issue of promoting energy independence and fighting global warming. And Mr. Chairman, uh, before I yield back, I'm pleased to hear that we will be uh, addressing in more detail the issue of forest management. Mr. Walden and I have worked on that issue in the past on the Natural Resources Committee and uh, think it's another area, particularly in rural parts of the country, where we can help find solutions to the issue of, of greenhouse gases. Thank you, and I yield back. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, chair recognizes the uh, gentleman from Missouri, uh, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, I, I'm pretty much convinced 
that the legitimate epicenter for the war on terror is in coal mines, that if we are serious about reducing our dependence on foreign oil, uh, we must um, hasten the development of the technology to produce uh, clean coal. I was somewhat alarmed to discover that the uh, capital power plant uh, burned uh, 17,000 tons of coal uh, each year which produces about 60,000 tons of CO2. And I think uh, following the leadership of our speaker and uh, the vision of our, our chairman, Mr. Markey, uh, we did pass um, HR 3221, which I, th I think uh, uh, is revolutionary in that we are beginning uh, to uh, install technologies um, for the capture and storage of CO2. Um, I'm also, uh, in, in, in connecting this with your testimony, concerned about uh, something the President quite often mentions, which is this future gen power plant. Uh, I'm interested in how real it is and if, in fact, it, it is real. Uh, what uh, do those of you who I consider to be members of the coal intelligentsia um, uh, believe we can uh, expect from uh, this uh, future gen power plant. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. Uh, the gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is a, a very a difficult and interesting subject, and as I said yesterday in our hearing um, on uh, coal uh, to liquid, that uh, we need to keep an open mind on this. And uh, I have to find myself in agreement with the ranking member in, the f in uh, looking at this as a tremendous opportunity for our country and uh, for many sectors of the economy that can take advantage of coal uh, and, uh, and use it in a way that does not impact the uh, global warming issue. Uh, for example, I heard recently of, a, uh, of an interesting study that took place in Canada uh, that affects uh, states like uh, Wyoming that have a lot of wind and a lot of coal. Uh, if you put in a large wind, uh, wind power plant, about 20 percent of that wind power can be considered to be base load, whereas the other 80 percent is intermittent and can be used to process coal uh, to produce energy products and to produce construction materials. Uh, and so the coal and wind make a good partnership, uh, which was quite surprising to me because I'm a wind power advocate and I spent my career in wind energy. Uh, so it was interesting to see that development. Uh, you would have expected coal and gas to make a good partner, but it doesn't because gas-powered uh, pow gas plants require high operating um, performance, and when you turn them back, when wind comes up, they operate poorly. So a coal and wind is the natural uh, partnership. So I'd like to see that kind of uh, advancement, that kind of research, uh, open up new opportunities for both renewable and uh, the old fossil fuel types of power. So I'm looking forward to your testimony. Thank you for coming in today. And uh, we'll uh, reserve the balance of my time for questions. Thank you. Great. Um, the gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, welcome. Uh, I was going to call you the coal elite, but thank you to uh, Mr. Cleaver. I'll change that to coal intelligentsia. I, uh, um, obviously, this is a, uh, a question that we're considering today of great importance because of the abundance of, of coal in our country and the need for our uh, uh, energy policy to change away from um, oil, but at the same time, uh, as many uh, have mentioned, and as you all know, that uh, uh, getting the carbon emissions under control is critical to our uh, dealing with global warming, which is the other uh, mandate of this committee. And uh, so I'm just hoping to hear from, uh, from the panel, in addition to the, uh, uh, the expert uh, testimony, which is 
uh, about to be given um, about our ability to import, incorporate uh, sequestration technology into new plants, uh, uh, whether we could be doing more to retrofit existing plants uh, with post-combustion method methods. Um, the balance between or the choice between cap and trade and carbon tax, uh, which is uh, uh, they're talked about sometimes uh, as alternatives and sometimes as complementary um, approaches uh, about the developing world and how the U.S. can be more of a leader than we are uh, and how we can take a more cooperative approach from the outset. Um, whether any of our, uh, of our experts are aware of an inter intergovernmental or international scientific efforts to develop sequestration uh, in cooperation with these other countries to help them deploy them faster and um, uh, the potential for direct technology transfer once we de develop better uh, sequestration methods. Uh, I'm also interested in and hoping to hear ideas about incorporating carbon offsets into our trade agreements. Um, and was wondering if uh, Mr. Morris in particular could elaborate a little bit more on that possibility. Uh, his, uh, your testimony, sir, uh, makes reference to administering a border tax. Um, I'm wondering if there's possible way that this idea could be used to create a carbon tariff to use the market in driving countries like China to deal with emissions. And can we start incorporating these ideas now into our bilateral trade agreements without waiting for a new Kyoto? So there's, there's plenty to discuss. Uh, and um, Mr. Chairman, I uh, thank you for holding this hearing. I yield back the balance of my time. Great. Gentlemen's time has expired and time for all opening statements from members has expired. We will now turn to our very distinguished panel um, and uh, we will welcome our very first uh, uh, witness uh, who is Wyoming Governor Dave Friedenthal. Uh, Wyoming is the largest coal producing state in the United States and it is also the largest energy exporting state uh, overall in the United States. Uh, Governor Friedenthal has a very long and distinguished career in public service and uh, in the private sector and there's probably no one um, in elective office in the United States that knows more about coal than Governor Friedenthal and we are very honored to have you with us here today, sir. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you. Um, first of all, Mr. Chairman, it's, it's clear that neither you nor I are under oath when you refer to me as having any expertise. So. Um, I guess you can get away with that. I'm not sure I know as much as I'd like to know about this. Um, I'm just going to fire through to try to deal with some of the questions. I think one of the things to understand about Wyoming in context was alluded to by the chairman, which is that uh, while we are the leading coal producer, um, natural gas production has actually eclipsed uh, coal production in our state in terms of value uh, to the economy. We are also, we produce half of the uh, uranium that is in this country. We have immense number of wind reserves which uh, are generally being tapped but will be tapped more seriously as you get some power lines. So from, from the point of view of, of, um, of Wyoming, whichever option you decide to pursue, we have an economic viability. What I am concerned about is, is that we are approaching coal, um, uh, frankly, failing to understand its role in the energy mix. And I, I'm pleased to hear the committee acknowledge that no matter what we do, we're going to be dealing with coal going forward. And it's an important element for us to, to focus on. And in that context, I was perplexed that uh, while the, the bills that were passed by the respective um, Senate and House talked about incentives and studies with regard to carbon capture and sequestration, they didn't talk about incentives for the coal technologies that are essential to have some carbon to capture. I mean, if you're going to capture it, uh, transport it, and place it in the ground, you're going to have to be incenting coal plants that have the capacity for that stream of carbon to be captured, either through retrofit of the existing fleet or through uh, underwriting some uh, development of technologies and, I think, uh, commercial demonstration of some of the new technologies that people are talking about because the, we've bifurcated the issue. We've said, let's talk about carbon capture and sequestration, but carbon capture is really tied to the technologies that we're going to encourage to develop so that it, there's some carbon to capture, uh, that you have the capacity to capture it, then the capacity to move it and the capacity to inject it. 
The second point that I would make is you need to distinguish between carbon capture and sequestration and utilization of carbon for enhanced oil recovery. Enhanced oil recovery is one of, it's a process by which you, you infuse the CO2 into the ground that breaks up the, the molecules, moves faster and we do it. That is not the same as carbon sequestration. That um, field that is, that is amenable to that, and I think it's some of the low-hanging fruit for us as a country to get carbon uh, sequestered, but, but that is, you're not sure it's going to stay there. And so until you have made some uh, significant study or effort to assure yourself um, that, that that carbon is going to stay, that you can cap all those holes in that field, I would urge you to be careful about equating enhanced oil recovery with carbon sequestration because they're not the same. Now, they may be able to be the same in the sense that the fields may be amenable. The other thing is that, is that be careful about thinking of natural gas as the automatic answer. In our state, we have a, an immense amount of gas produced. We also have processing plants which for every MCS of, of gas that is produced and shipped to California, two MCF of CO2 are thrown off either into the atmosphere or into enhanced oil recovery. So when you when you start talking about how blessed gas is, and I love natural gas, it's great for my state, but I will tell you, in the context of your environmental calculations, it is it is an answer, but it is not a perfect answer, and you need to be careful about going forward with that. With regard to uh, sequestration, we have a, a lot of experience on enhanced oil recovery. Uh, we found a number of formations which may be amenable to long-term sequestration, but the government, the federal government, needs to step up, fund those experiments, and make sure that it works. Don't mandate something uh, without putting in place a pathway for us to get there, a pathway both for the states, the federal government, and more importantly for the private sector. One of the things that I was asked to comment on is the role of the states. I have made my career beaten up on the federal government and it pains me greatly to be here and suggest that we need a federal mandate and a federal roadmap to deal with this because I don't believe that while Oliver Wendell Holmes is right that states are the laboratories, ultimately the, the ground rules are going to have to be set by the federal government and you see the individual state efforts and the individual uh, accumulation of states in the northeast and in the west, all we're really doing is balkanizing this economy. And if we don't come up with a serious set of ground rules that recognize that this is a, an interrelated economy throughout the, throughout the United States, all you're going to do is leave individual states to make decisions and to give signals to the private sector which are contrary to the fact that these are all interrelated transmission grids, these are all interrelated systems, and I would encourage you that the federal government, none of the private money is going to move, none of the states are going to know realistically what to do until the federal government drops the other shoe, which is to say, how are we going to monetize carbon in some form? be it a tax or cap and trade. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I note that my time's up. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here. Um, a little more than you wanted to hear, but... Um, no, no, it, again, you know, Mark Twain used to say that a, an expert is anyone who lives more than 500 miles <laughs> away from the problem. And, uh, uh, and you, of course, live uh, in Wyoming, so... It's a congressional expert that's the oxymoron, like jumbo shrimp or Salt Lake City nightlife. I mean, there is no such thing. Okay? So we need people like you, Governor, who uh, come into town who actually are the experts to help us to understand these issues. Um, I'm pleased to introduce our second uh, witness, Mr. Michael Morris. He's the chairman and CEO of American Electric Power. AEP is the largest electric utility in the United States, serving over 5 million uh, consumers in 11 states uh, and is also the largest consumer of coal in uh, the United States. Under Mr. Morris's leadership, AEP has been an industry leader in the development of carbon capture and storage technology. Uh, we welcome you, sir. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for the opportunity to be here. I'm intrigued by the questions that you've all racked up for us in your various introductory statements, and I know that given the time that we'll have to give uh, comments and thoughts back and forth, this will be an extremely meaningful session. I surely want to say hi to the Congresswoman from Michigan who, while I was at Consumers Power for 12 years, had a lot of fun working with over the years, and you as well when I was at Northeast Utilities, Mr. Chairman. I see this challenge not unlike uh, the ranking member. It is, in fact, an opportunity 
Uh, in your introductory comments of me, you mentioned 5.1 million customers. I have an obligation to make certain that there's adequate energy supply for those men and women in those industries and in those commercial operations 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day of the year. And for the most part, we do that. When weather intervenes, sometimes we aren't there when they want us, and that is very disturbing to them, and understandably so. Coal, as the governor said, is an essential part, as many of you said in your opening comments, to the overall equation of how we'll satisfy that demand across this entire country. Doing that with the respect for the environment is essential as well. To that end, we filed testimony to touch on many of those points, but let me subset on a couple of the specific questions that were sent to me uh, by the committee and by you. Uh, the fact, questions three and four, what is my company doing about this challenge? And, and our testimony is full of those kinds of issues. But secondarily, uh, question number four, when is a practical carbon capture and storage technology deployment going to be available for this country? We would believe that in the timeline in the latter half of the next decade, we will have validated concepts that are already out in the marketplace, yet not out of the laboratory in the marketplace, to uh, show that, in fact, just as other flue gas issues or prior burn issues can be removed from the stream of carbon of, of the coal fuel, we'll have a chance to do that. We intend by 2009 at Appalachian Power in, uh, the, that serves the states of West Virginia and Virginia to do a 30 megawatt validation project on capture and storage there. We have worked with Battelle. We have subsurface storage actually at our Mountaineer site, and that would be our plan uh, by 2009. By 2011, 2012, we'll move that validation project out to Rogers County, Oklahoma, where at uh, one of our major northeastern public service Oklahoma stations, we'll capture uh, up to 200 megawatts of uh, carbon. There, we'll use it, as the governor suggested, in enhanced oil recovery uh, for the gas and oil fields in, in Oklahoma. We think that's an excellent way to go about doing it. For the new plants, and those are both retrofit opportunities, which is essential for us to continue to keep the fleet uh, out there for all of us in this country. For new plants, integrated gas combined cycle technology, ultra supercritical technology, which we would hope to build also in Oklahoma with uh, other partners, are part of the answer to use coal logically as we go forward. So to the validation projects in the integrated gas combined cycle, we believe by the middle of next decade to the beginning of 2020, uh, that technology will be there for us. And we as an industry, we surely as a company, will begin to deploy that as fast as we can. I think it's important to the notion of 150 coal plants to be built in some very short period of time. The EIA, unfortunately, is always wrong in their forecast. And there's no way in the world we're going to build 30 or 40 nuclear stations, no way in the world we're going to build 150 uh, coal-based generation stations in this country. Remember, in each and every of your states, we can't simply build whatever we'd like. We can only build what the Public Utility Commission, Public Service Commission, or regulatory body will allow us to build. Coal plants need to be built, and they, in fact, will be built between now and then. As to the notion of putting uh, technology out there, what everyone will build at least will be coal capture ready stations, if not coal capture deployed technology, because it isn't there yet. This is a very different timeline than the one that we shared a few decades ago, when my company and my industry were very strong in the notion of not now, not ever. This is a willing industry, a willing company, a willing people who simply want to have the timeline to allow the technology to develop so that, in fact, we just don't get a political soundbite, but we get something that works. To the gentlewoman uh, from the Dakotas, I was part of the environmental study that, uh, at American Electric Power Company, or excuse me, at American Natural Resources, when the gasification project was built. It has turned out to be an excellent idea. The day it came online, it made gas for $8 a million BTUs into a $2 market, and everyone thought it was a terrible idea. Today, it does exactly as you suggest. In the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, we have used more electricity in this country than ever before every decade. The air and the water have gotten cleaner in each of those decades. If we are logical about how we do this, we can find an answer. As to the global nature, it isn't U.S. warming. It's called global warming. We need to make certain that China, India, and other countries join us in this endeavor. What the unions and American Electric Power have put forward and is being embraced at least at the principal committee in the House and being embraced uh, in writing in the Senate 
is a concept that is WTO compliant that ought to address that issue and cause them economically to want to do something. Mr. Markey, in your opening comments, you mentioned a number of plants being built here. They will be carbon capture ready. The plants that are being built in China are not. That's a huge difference. This is a global issue, and there's no sense saddling the U.S. economy without addressing that global nature. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. I look forward to the questions and answers. Thank you very much. Um, our next witness is Mr. Kyle Bauer. He is the director of the Department of Energy's National Energy Technology Laboratory, a nuclear engineer by training. Mr. Bauer oversees much of the federal government's research and development efforts on coal-fired generation technologies and carbon capture and storage. He is recognized as one of the leading experts in this field. We welcome you uh, today, Mr. Bauer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I appreciate the importance that this committee has in addressing the future of the United States and the world from energy and the environmental impacts of its use and production. The economic prosperity of the United States over the past century has benefited from the abundance of fossil fuels found in North America. These fuels are important to our energy security and the global economic competitiveness we experience. However, these concerns of climate change and air pollution challenge our ability to continue to take full advantage of these resources. Recently, countries like China have seen dramatic growth, as we've mentioned earlier and the committee members have all recognized. But a point that you might not have seen just recently came forward. In the last quarter, China put online 30 gigawatts of coal-fired power generation. That's four to five times more than we've built in this country in the last five years. That's a very important point. India is also putting things online. And we believe that the Eastern European countries will also continue to depend on coal power generation as one of their mainstays. So this global climate change issue and CO2 from coal-fired and, and fossil-fired plants is extremely important. In 2004, the global anthropogenic CO2 emission amounted to 27 billion metric tons. By 2030, global CO2 emissions are projected at 43 billion metric tons per year. China and India and the other non-OECD Asian countries will contribute 57 percent of that. In comparison, uh, the United States will compare from coal-fired generation will contribute to 6.8 percent of that. Nevertheless, because of these concerns of global climate change and the need to stabilize greenhouse gas emissions, the U.S. must consider rolling back CO2 emissions to levels substantially below today's. Carbon capture and storage technologies offer a great opportunity to pursue these reductions as the committee has recognized in their opening statements. Fortunately, the U.S. and Canada are blessed with an abundance of geologic storage capacity. At the current rate of energy production use, we could potentially store all of the associated CO2 emissions in North America for a period of over several hundred years. One scenario that DOE has looked at in terms of accelerating commercial application of carbon capture technology is to couple CO2 capture from power plants with enhanced oil recovery, as the committee has recognized. This may re represent the earliest and most economic, and I emphasize economic, project opportunities for a power company to address the technical and economic risks of investing in carbon capture technology. In today's world of global commerce, there is presently no significant business incentive to deploy carbon capture technology. In order for the marketplace to more aggressively address our nation's need for effective, safe, permanent, and economic carbon mitigation options, we must move forward towards the following, I would suggest. An established regulatory framework for industry and its financial partners in order that they may do a assessment of the risk in the financial investments required the development of accurate methods to calculate the allocation of risk and potential financial consequences associated with long-term liability, not decades, but hundreds of years. An international agreement on patent and intellectual property protection so those who can come up with the best ideas feel they have a chance to realize a financial return on their investments of their intellectual and financial capital. And the development of advanced technologies needed to deliver an economic option. DOE's R&D program is aimed at providing the scientific and technological foundation for carbon capture and storage for both new and existing fossil fuel power plants. And I say fossil fuel. As we move to more natural gas and more LNG, there's a recent study that just was released in Environmental and uh, Energy Weekly that uh, Carnegie Mellon has put forward. The study on LNG suggests that the CO2 related from the full production 
and this is somewhat akin to what the governors have mentioned about the production of natural gas even domestically, the release of CO2 into production of natural gas, conversion to LNG, shipping, and then turning it back into gas in the pipeline may wind up being just as much when you bring in the power plant and transport as a coal fire plant does in the CO2 release. Now, that's one study. There's been a few other studies similarly, but that again puts us in an awkward spot as fuel shifting being the only solution. We've got to find a portfolio of opportunities. The program we're, we're heading up with DOE is an opportunity that recently presented itself using coal and biomass and capturing and sequestering that. Recognizing that biomass is often considered as CO2 neutral because of the short cycle of plant life and the ability to withdraw through photosynthesis CO2 from the atmosphere. However, if biomass and coal are used together and the biomass and coal resulting CO2 are all captured and sequestered, you actually wind up with a not only avoidance of release of CO2 from coal, but an actual effective withdrawal of CO2 from the inventory associated with the biological plant growth cycle. NETL systems engineers have modeled this, and we believe that by co-feeding 11 percent biomass by energy value with coal through an integrated gasification combined cycle plant, which would employ 90 percent capture and sequestration, you might call this coal biomass IGCC, the net greenhouse gas emissions would be zero or possibly even negative. A similar theory applies for coal biomass liquids production with CO2 capture and sequestration. To put it as an example, a nominal 500 megawatt plant consuming 910 tons per day of switchgrass and 5,000 tons per day of coal and capturing 12,000 tons per day of CO2 would yield a net zero life cycle carbon footprint, including not only the power generation, but the upstream coal and biomass preparation and transport. Carbon, DOE's carbon sequestration is addressing these challenges through applied research, proof of concept technology evaluation, and pile scale testing, large scale deployments, stakeholder involvement, and public outreach. And those last two are also important as the technological because it's going to be done locally. I realize I've taken my time, and I thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Chairman, and your patience with me. Thank you. I appreciate it, Mr. Bauer, very much. Uh, and now I'm, I'm pleased to uh, welcome Mr. David Hawkins, who is the director of the Nat Natural Resources Defense Council's Climate Center. Um, Mr. Hawkins is a former assistant administrator of the EPA and has over 30 years of experience on air quality, climate change, and energy policy issues. Um, I've been a congressman for 30 years. David Hawkins has been testifying uh, on these issues for all 30 years up here. So there's nobody that knows more about this issue than you do. Uh, David, whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I have uh, 12 points to make and five minutes to make them, so let me get started. Uh, the first is that uh, coal use trends in the United States and globally, if continued, will make uh, protecting the climate impossible. But coal is abundant and relatively low cost, so trying to convince world leaders to uh, give up coal uh, would take a long time, a time that we do not have. So a critical need is to keep new coal plants from being built unless they actually capture their CO2. Uh, that's the only way we can reconcile these two imperatives. About 3,000 coal plants uh, uh, are now on the drawing board, new coal plants globally around the world um, between now and 2030. That's uh, less than a 25-year investment period. Two-thirds of those are in planned for the developing world, and 40 percent of them are in China. Now, if these plants operate for 60 years and they release all of their carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, the total cumulative emissions during that 60-year period would be 750 billion tons of carbon dioxide. How do we put that number in perspective? Well, it's 30 percent more than all of the carbon dioxide released from coal use in human history. And that's from a 25-year period of investment from one technology. So we clearly have a, uh, a problem that we need to address immediately. Fortunately, carbon capture and geologic disposal technologies are ready for use today. Unfortunately, they're not being used in the power sector. What we need, as has been observed, is a policy framework 
that assures that carbon capture and disposal systems are used for new coal plants and gradually get used on all coal plants. To do this, we recommend a three-part policy package to assure that carbon capture and disposal gets deployed without additional delay. First, enactment of a comprehensive cap-and-trade system in the United States. We need a comprehensive system in order to get the cut cuts in greenhouse gas reductions that we need and uh, to provide the flexibility that will keep costs low. Second, enactment of a low-carbon generation obligation that applies to coal plant operators. This provision would assure that an increasing fraction of America's coal-fired electricity uses carbon capture and disposal, and that fraction would increase over time. Now, by making this obligation tradable, the provision would spread the additional costs of those first carbon capture and disposal plants uh, over the entire uh, customer base of the United States rather than the single customer base of the company that happens to build the first uh, one or two plants. We think that's an important way of keeping costs low as this technology is deployed. Third, we recommend uh, enactment of a new source performance standard for new coal plants. This will assure that we don't build any more new coal plants that release their carbon to the atmosphere. The first rule of holes is that when you're in one, stop digging. Well, building new coal plants that release their carbon to the atmosphere would just dig us deeper, and we can't afford that. So by combining the new source standard with a low carbon generation obligation, we think we can assure a smooth transition away from coal plants that each today emit millions of tons to the atmosphere every single year. We believe that Congress can and should act this year to pass legislation with features, with these features. And if you do this, we think that the world will take notice and that the opportunities that uh, the ranking member Sensenbrenner spoke about will emerge, that we indeed can be a marketer of ideas and technology to the rest of the world. The world will follow. We have the power to change international practice in designing coal-fired power plants. We don't have the time to wait. Thank you very much for your attention. I just want to note it's an unusual moment where a witness has given back 30 seconds. Just doesn't happen that often. I just wanted to take note of it. Let me recognize the uh, our next witness, Mr. Robert Sussman, who is a partner at the law firm of Latham and Watkins. Mr. Sussman is a former deputy administrator of the EPA during the Clinton administration and is recognized as one of the leading environmental lawyers in uh, the country. Uh, we welcome you, sir. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's, it's a, a pleasure to, to be here today. Uh, I'm presenting my testimony on behalf of the Center for American Progress, uh, a nonpartisan research and educational institute dedicated to promoting a strong, just, and free America. The Center has recently published two reports on carbon capture and sequestration, uh, which I wrote along with Ken Berlin, uh, one of my colleagues. And what I'd like to do today is to highlight the uh, conclusions to these reports, which are uh, attached to my written testimony. And, uh, uh, hopefully will be in the, uh, the record for uh, this hearing. Uh, what we've heard from several witnesses is that the challenge posed by a dramatic increase in greenhouse gas emissions uh, as a result of new coal plants is, uh, is serious and, and urgent. If these plants do not control their emissions, uh, the consequence will be to add uh, many millions of tons of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Uh, and this growth in emissions uh, will make it very, very difficult uh, to move in the direction that uh, many of us recognize is imperative, which is uh, to reduce uh, emissions uh, ultimately on the order of 70 to 80 percent 
uh, by 2050. Uh, the most promising and, and, as best I can tell, the only path to control CO2 emissions from new coal plants is uh, carbon capture and storage. The task facing Congress is to maximize the likelihood that CCS is widely deployed on an expeditious but realistic timetable and at a reasonable cost. Uh, the stakes are very high. If we succeed at this task, we will assure coal a secure place in the future U.S. energy mix. If we fail, coal's historic role as a vital energy resource in this country uh, will be at risk. And I, I want to over underscore uh, uh, that point because uh, there is, I think, growing evidence that uh, coal faces a very uncertain future in the United States uh, without carbon capture and storage. Uh, two years ago, there were rosy predictions of a resurgence of coal, uh, but today there is growing uh, public opposition to uh, new coal plants all around the country, uh, legal and political challenges to these plants uh, are routine. Uh, in a remarkable development, we saw private equity investors uh, taking over uh, TXU, a large uh, Texas utility, announced uh, that they would cancel eight out of 11 uh, proposed coal plants if their buyout uh, was consummated. Uh, recently in California, in California and Florida, uh, we've seen uh, some significant barriers uh, erected to uh, the construction of new coal plants. And uh, recognizing these trends, it's, it's interesting that in July, uh, Citigroup downgraded the stocks of coal companies across the board uh, maintaining, and I quote, that prophecies of a new wave of coal fire generation have vaporized uh, while clean coal technologies uh, remain a decade away or more. Um, these trends, I think, underscore uh, the urgency of this challenge and, and also uh, the very important solution uh, that timely CCS deployment uh, can provide. Um, let me turn to cap and trade programs uh, and to the very important question of whether uh, the cap and trade pro proposals that are now on the table uh, in Congress will lead to timely deployment of CCS. Unfortunately, our analysis uh, indicates that the initial stages of cap and trade programs are not likely to create carbon prices high enough to eliminate the cost differential between new coal plants uh, with CCS and those without it. Uh, this would mean that new coal plant owners are unlikely to install CCS systems until the emission caps for these programs become sufficiently stringent to increase the price of Mr. CO2 Sussman. allowances to at least uh, $30 per ton. This will probably not occur uh, until 2030 and Mr. maybe even later. Ms. Sussman, I apologize, sir, but your time has expired. Okay. So you'll have plenty of time in the question and answer period, I'm sure. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you. And uh, our final witness is Mr. Stuart Dalton, who is Director for the Generation Sector of the Electric Power Research Institute. Mr. Dalton is a leading expert on coal fire generation and carbon capture and storage. Among other efforts in this sphere, Mr. Dalton led EPRI's contribution to the National Coal Council's report on CCS and the Coal Utilization Council's uh, Research Council's Technology Roadmap. We welcome you, sir. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to speak today before the committee. We believe that the through the development and deployment of advanced coal plants with integrated CO2 capture and storage, coal power can be part of the solution to addressing both our growing energy needs, needs for energy independence, and for the global climate change concerns. 
However, we believe a sustained RD&D program at greater levels of investment and resolution of legal and regulatory unknowns for long-term CO2 storage will be required to achieve the technologies. In direct response to a couple of the questions that were posed earlier by the committee, I would uh, suggest that if you use today's technology, it would probably increase the cost of a conventional pulverized coal plant, assuming you were scaling up with current technology and took that risk, by some 60 to 80 percent, the increase in the wholesale cost of power. And if you put it on a gasification plant using today's technology, that might be a 40 to 50 percent increase in wholesale cost of power. That's to the how much question. It's to the when question. Certainly, that's uh, heavily debated. We've heard uh, different comments on when, but three to five years to build it, three to five years to inject, and three to five years to monitor adds up to a significant amount of time. And that's one of the questions is when could these be built and proven in, in operation? We have a uh, program that's been developed with about 60 organizations from five continents uh, working, which has laid out an R&D &D program to move the technology forward. We see crucial roles for industry and governments worldwide in aggressively pursuing carbon capture and storage. A couple of key points from my, uh, written, tech, uh, my written submission. Advanced coal technology power plants with the integrated capture and storage will be crucial to the U.S. The availability of advanced technologies could dramatically reduce the projected increases in cost of wholesale electricity under a carbon cap, thereby saving the U.S. economy as much as one trillion by uh, 2050 in our estimation. The program has identified pathways to demonstrate by 2025 a portfolio of attractive, highly efficient power and integrated technologies. We see that with an aggressive program, multiple large-scale capture and storage demonstrations by the middle of next decade and some commercial applications starting around 2020. We'll take additional sustained efforts past the first applications to take the test technology down the learning curve in cost. We've identified RD&D that's in the testimony of 8 billion between now and 2017 and 17 billion by 2025 needed to begin immediately to fully test at scale. We believe that the House uh, Bill 3221 appears to be consistent with some of these recommendations. Major non-technical barriers must be addressed as well, such as CO2 storage and liability. Potential sale of uh, CO2 to EOR may help some of the early applications in specific localities, as we've heard. But we believe ultimately that the primary economic driver will be the value of carbon emissions uh, that results from any future climate policy. We have just produced a study, I hold it in my hand, electricity, uh, the uh, power to reduce CO2 emissions, and a companion study earlier this year, electricity technology in a carbon con constrained future. Emissions over the next 25 years uh, could be reduced in our estimation. The study shows the largest sin single contributor is reduction by CCS technologies. It also showed that a generation efficiency enhancements can contribute significantly. Those two are the actually largest contributors to reduction in CO2 in this study. It uh, shows that U.S. generation mix based on a full portfolio of technologies, including advanced coal technologies, integrated with CCS and advanced uh, light water reactors, results in a wholesale reduction of uh, cost of $1 trillion with a stronger manufacturing economy. The portfolio aspect is critical because no single advanced coal technology or any generating technology has clear-cut economic advantages in each region, with each coal, and across the range of applications. We want to uh, see how we can minimize economic disruption, and that, we believe, lies in a full portfolio of technologies. The four areas are increasing efficiency and reliability of integrated gasification combined cycle power plants, as well as cost reductions, increasing thermodynamic efficiency of coal-fired power plants, as was uh, said by Mr. Morris, improving technologies for capture of CO2, reliable, acceptable technologies for long-term storage, and providing the financial mechanisms to share risk. In short, comprehensive uh, 
program is what's needed. We thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Dalton, very much. Um, there are two roll calls um, on the House floor right now, with about six minutes for the members to go over there to make those votes. So uh, we'll take a very brief recess, uh, and I think that we can reconvene around 11.15, if uh, uh, all of you can take note of that, and we'll take a brief recess. And the chair will recognize himself for a round of questions. Let me begin with you, Governor. Uh, in your testimony, you state that many major investments in the electricity generation sector will not come to fruition until we provide regulatory certainty by enacting federal limits on carbon dioxide emissions. Is it fair to say that further delays in federal action will impose significant costs and that it's in everyone's best interest that we take action as soon as possible? Um, Mr. Chairman, I, being a lawyer, I hesitate to, re to, to agree in the affirmative because the devil is in the details. I do believe, and, and we, we have the same people come talk to us who come talk to this committee. They want to make the investment, but they don't know, in the absence of a uh, federal regulatory scheme, whether they're going to be able to capture the uh, return. That is, will it be recognized by the public utility commissions around the country as being legitimately in their, in their uh, rate base? The, um, um, but having said that, the action that we take becomes important because it has to have some form of a glide path that recognizes the relative availability of the technologies um, at a given state in time. So, for instance, I think if, if one of the suggestions that I've heard is that we would just say nobody can build any power plants today um, because um, uh, if they don't have carbon capture and sequestration. The problem with that is, is that in spite of all of the rhetoric, nobody has actually done carbon capture. Um, and so what you need to do is something that I think most of the companies are looking at is give us a clue what we need to do. We'll, we'll try to make this thing carbon capture ready but we may need to proceed to meet our demand uh, with some level of construction. So I think the failure to act uh, freezes in place a lot of investment money. If we act wrong, we'll permanently freeze it out. So we need to act in a way that says um, we're going to be realistic about the standard. Here's what it is. Here's your guidance. If you do this, you can get your recovery. Now, you cite a projection that uh, GDP will decline by 400 to $800 billion. Mm -hmm if CCS is not uh, deployed. Can you expand on that and the likely cost? It, it's one of those uh, numbers that my staff picked up. It's either out of the MIT study. Uh, I think it's out of the MIT study um, because, frankly, um, as I admitted before, I'm a lawyer, so I don't pretend to have the answer. But, but what we're saying is, is that if we don't um, act uh, and somehow we act inappropriately, I think those are the costs. Uh, and so the, this is something that has to be done with a scalpel and not with a machete. We need to very carefully think about uh, how we're going to sculpt the regulatory environment so that uh, the states can, can essentially, in a Clean Air Act model, have some uh, parallel system that helps on the enforcement under a state-approved implementation plan. And the private sector then knows what standards they have to meet which of those costs can be recaptured through the uh, various uh, public utility commissions and the means by which they're going to be captured. If we lay that out, I think people will react because they, they're the same ones who talk to you. They come and say, look, we're ready to do this, but, but we can't do it out of, um, uh, out of speculation, particularly in a regulated environment. Can I ask you, uh, can I ask Mr. Morris this? Uh, what does carbon capture ready mean to AEP in terms of the technology you are going to install? Uh, Congressman, for us, the, we see carbon capture in two different worlds. Uh, the most important and the most critical for all of us, this country and my company, uh, is the retrofit technology on the existing fleet. Uh, because we as a nation, uh, based on, on the comments that you and others made in your introductory uh, uh, timeline, uh, point to the notion that over half of the today's generation fleet 
is coal-based, actually more than half of the megawatt hours produced and therefore used to fuel the U.S. economy is coal-based. So we have to find a way uh, to capture on the existing stations. And uh, that's why we're going forward with the validation projects that I mentioned in West Virginia and in Oklahoma so that we can, across our entire fleet, uh, put that technology to work, presuming that the validation undertakings work. Now, I, like the governor, am a lawyer environmentalist, so I'm not bothered by the engineering challenges that my team constantly <laughs> tells me about. I'm blessed at American Electric Power having among the best engineers for over a century. Uh, we've made many, many uh, breakthrough technological changes in this industry, and we think we're doing that again now. Secondly, to the comments that David made, to the comments that the governor just made, we see this as a challenge for the new stations as well. Uh, I would not argue that you cannot go forward at the state level and get authority to build a carbon-ready and as soon as technology is validated, deployed, power plant built without federal intervention, without a federal program. I think that there will be bold states that will take that step. As I think the committee knows clearly in our testimony, we have such applications in front of the commission in the state of Ohio, and they've given us the preliminary go-ahead that is now being challenged uh, at the Supreme Court level in the state of Ohio, which is the jurisdiction of, uh, of appeal by right. And in West Virginia, uh, we're going forward with an integrated plant. We filed that to the West Virginia Commission and Virginia. Our Appalachian Power Company serves uh, both of those particular states. So uh, we have every reason to believe that the potential to get those plants approved without a federal process will work. But it is a societal cost, and it is a state's rights issue. And when you think of Virginia and West Virginia, very important coal-based states in this country, uh, it, may, it may well be in their best interest. Clearly, Governor Manchin is a supporter of it. Governor Kane appears to be a supporter of the issue. But it is the charge of their state regulatory commission to make those decisions. Out west, where you're working with lower-ranked coals, uh, no offense, Governor, uh, we're hoping to deploy what's called ultra-supercritical technology, which has not been done in this country. It's been done in Germany. It's been done in Japan. Higher temperatures, higher pressures, less fuel in for megawatt hours out. More expensive than supercritical, no question. That issue, in fact, this very day uh, in, uh, in Louisiana, excuse me, in Little Rock, Arkansas, we have a team testifying in front of the Arkansas Commission seeking authority to do that. We have closed the record on a similar plant to be built in Oklahoma, as I mentioned. So I'm a believer that with logic and, and uh, timelines that are realistic, states will go forward and allow us to do these things because they will, in fact, validate the carbon capture, both for the existing fleet as well as technologies for the new fleet. And as the technology goes forward uh, for the capture, uh, we'll simply deploy that as we go. I think that's a much better approach than a command control approach. That probably was necessary in Clean Air Act days because so many in our industry thought not now, not ever. This is a willing industry. Uh, we just need the support of the states. Okay, Governor, uh, to get 30 that seconds, done. Governor. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I might, the. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I might, the, under our law, we, we will and have and will continue to permit uh, coal fired plants. The more interesting question to me is um, if those uh, plants choose to take actions uh, to be carbon ready, will those um, expenses be capturable in the rate base? And I think under the current law in most states it would not be mm -hmm. because it is not least cost, most reliable, um, whereas the, and so I'm, I'm, I, I do believe we're going to continue to build plants, but if we're going to want to send a signal to people that says as you build them, you should um, contemplate this, we also have to send a commensurate market signal in some sense that they're going to be able to recapture those costs. Otherwise, those are shareholder costs and not uh, ratepayer costs. And I think that, that the importance of this discussion is that whatever we do in this area, it's going to cost and it's going to be expensive. And one of the things uh, that, that, and it's entirely an appropriate investment of societal resources, the only thing I would ask is as the committee move forward, you think about the consequences of that um, up and down the income scale. In our state, um, the uh, bottom quartile, uh, esti we estimate, spends about 16% uh, of their disposable income on energy. 
the top quartile spends somewhere between one and a half and three. And so you begin um, these increments, and, and I was having this discussion with Mr. Hawkins that, that all of these things cost funding, and, and it's an appropriate expenditure, but we need to be mindful of the people who are going to bear those costs, not just the, we may have the capacity to impose those costs. The correctness of how we impose those costs, I think, has to be a consideration. Right. You invoke Mr. Hawkins' name. Can you make some observations here on what you just heard? Certainly, with your permission. Uh, the, I, I, I think that, first, the MIT study on the future coal has some very informative findings on the concept of capture ready, and, and I think it's worth uh, the committee taking a look at. Uh, uh, it's an elusive concept and may prove to be uh, illusory. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Energy Policy Act of 2005 has a definition of capture ready that essentially is leaving space for installation of some undefined piece of equipment, which has led me to say that, well, I have a driveway that's Ferrari ready, <laughs> if, if, if that's the definition. Um, the, uh, it, it's not going to be a simple uh, matter to take a plant which is optimized to run without capturing its CO2 and turn it into a plant that uh, is optimized to run and capture its CO2. The energy flows are significantly different. Uh, the balance of plant equipment is significantly different. What, you, what hardware you put on in the first place is a complicated calculus. All of that leads us to believe uh, that we uh, need to uh, uh, jump to the outcome that we need to pursue in order to uh, reconcile the use of coal and protecting the climate, which is just to have a policy that says, starting in X date, uh, new coal plants will have to capture their carbon, period. And I've outlined in the testimony proposals on how you can spread the additional costs associated with that policy so that no single company's customers see a rate shock. Uh, this is not, we're not talking about doing this for all 300 gigawatts of uh, coal-fired power plants that are out there operating today. We're talking about phasing it in, one plant at a time. And the trick is to get those costs to be spread across the electric consumer's rate pace. And that's a reasonable thing to do because by keeping coal in the mix, we are avoiding spikes in gas prices that will wind up costing customers of gas-based utilities money, even if they never consume a kilowatt hour of, co of, of power made from coal. So this is a reasonable approach. We need to get started, and we have the technology, and we should not, uh, we should not uh, flirt, uh, flirt further with the concept of capture ready, in my view. Great. Well, my time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Inslee. Yeah, I want to pursue this issue of capture ready uh, because it seems more amorphous than a Ferrari even to me. Can any of you tell us what that would actually look like if we were going to say we want the industry after a certain date to, be, to build only capture ready plants? What would that look like if we know? Anyone? Let me, let me uh, try and answer to that, to that question. I, I, I think that to talking about a plant being capture ready uh, is only the first part of the equation. The real question is when is the plant going to implement CCS? And we have a proposal which is very similar to David's, which is a proposal for an emission performance standard uh, under which new plants would be required to implement CCS. Now, and this is a very important point, we would have a phase-in period. Uh, it basically, we're saying any plant built after 2008, which would be the presumed date when legislation would be enacted, any plant built after 2008 uh, would need to capture either by 2016 or four years after the first date of operation, uh, whichever is later. And the, the, the significance of that is that uh, there is a phase-in period. So if a plan is built on date X, uh, the owners of that plant know that they have to capture and sequester on date Y. And so therefore, when they build and design the plant, uh, they can take into account the requirement that capture will ultimately be necessary. During that phase-in period, the plant will be, quote, capture ready. But the important thing is to have 
a hard deadline for implementation. And we're saying that ought to be 2016 or four years after the plant begins operating, whatever is later. Mr. Inslee, I might offer an additional thought there because I think, uh, although I have no reason to argue with other of the colleagues, uh, my colleagues to the left, I'm a firm supporter of both of these as uh, uh, well-meaning individuals. So if capture ready <laughs> simply means, you know, buy a big lot, I couldn't agree more with, uh, with David that uh, that's uh, Ferrari uh, desirous or something. When we look at uh, the design of our integrated plants with the uh, General Electric Company and the Bechtel Corporation, uh, we're actually looking at the technologies, we're looking at the metallurgy, we're looking at the steam flows, we're looking at the things that will need to be done to make certain that once the technology of capturing the carbon out of the fuel stream before it's introduced to the plant, very different from a post-combustion where you're capturing the carbon out of the flue gas, very, very different concepts, uh, is a technology that will be there and we're looking at the requirements of the turbine itself, which will mostly run on oxygen then, rather than run on the synthetic gas. The synthetic gas itself will be mostly oxygen rather than a methane-based gas, which we're all much more familiar with. So, so to David's point, if capture ready simply means buy a big lot, you're not doing anything. To Bob's point, if we take this pre-requirement period, then, then no, all we're doing is building the same capture ready plant that I'm speaking to. So why have a command control approach to it when it isn't necessary? Because we will develop this technology as a country for the very uh, point that our friends from Wisconsin mentioned in his opening comments, because it's economically in our best interest, it's environmentally in the world's best interest that we develop that technology. To us, when we say capture ready, that's what we mean. There isn't a technology at the 639 megawatt level, which is what these plants will be, that's deployable today. It needs to be validated, tested, and then put in place. And that's a difference, I think. Not a great difference, but a difference between what we're talking about. Yeah. Mr. Inslee. Uh, Mr. Inslee, uh, it was, in my earlier comments, I made reference to the fact that there was no incentive package for these technologies, the sort of capture part, um, in, in trying to make these, these so-called clean coal technologies function. It seems to me that, that one of the ways to accelerate and to better define how quickly these can get into the plant is for the federal government to be as aggressive with regard to supporting these technologies as we have been with regard to wind power. We're all very proud of the progress that's made on wind power, uh, great benefits for my state and great potential benefits, but it's really dependent on a uh, tax credit that the federal government put in place for wind power. If we're equally serious, uh, the other reason I like the tax credit is, is it allows the delivered rate at the bus bar to be much more consistent with what the consumer can, uh, can uh, adopt out of wind power. I think we need to do the same level of uh, commitment uh, to these questions about the clean coal technologies, including the carbon capture portion, so that you don't end up with um, a physical impossibility or technological impossibility of knowing what to, how to prepare the plant for them or how and when to get them put in place. People have been sort of, oh, I don't want to do anything that helps, that appears to be helping coal. Uh, I, would, I would reverse that and say, if we don't do something to assist in the capture of carbon from coal, you're essentially putting in place a continuation of the status quo going forward because you have neither market forces nor tax forces that align the incentives for people to make those investments on a broad enough base. My time is up. I just want to comment. I, just, I hope we have cleaner coal before David Hawkins has a Ferrari in his driveway. I'll just tell you, that's, that's my time frame. Thank you. <laughs> Gentlemen's time has expired. The gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Sullivan. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And this is a question, I guess, for everybody. Uh, the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has concluded that uh, glo global greenhouse gas emissions must be cut by 50 to 85 percent by the year 2050. In order to keep atmospheric concentrations in the range of 450 to 490, uh, 490 parts per million CO2 equivalent, in your opinion, is there any way to meet that, that goal without including China and India? Absolutely none. China and India have to be a participant. Uh, the U.S. climate uh, science uh, uh, program has recently conducted a, a modeling analysis. Uh, the MIT study also conducted a, an, an analysis that 
basically points out that uh, uh, China and India do not have to proceed necessarily on the same precise timetable as industrialized countries, but if, if they don't come to the table and participate aggressively in the next 10 or 15 years, we can't meet those, uh, those targets. And, and that is why we are such strong advocates of U.S. leadership, because we think that the developing world is going to come to the table much faster if the U.S. is playing a leadership role. Anyone else? Um, I, I will uh, agree with what my colleagues have said and, and point out one other thing that uh, when we just think about my statement earlier about 30 gigawatts and a quarter of growth from Chinese coal production and power generation, and you think about TVs and computers, used to be that what America wants was what drove the world's marketplace. But since we don't build too many plants, whoever builds the most is going to most rapidly be able to move the technology. So if they don't engage in this conversation, the technology is not going anywhere. That's yep. the marketplace. Gavin. That's why, the, in fact, one other thing, tax credit or tax penalties on carbon, when we build power plants on here in this country, most of the heavy portions come from China. So if we penalize them with taxing their carbon and lack of doing by way of what we do on imports, I know there's a discussion on that somewhere else, uh, we'll probably pay for that tax on our import of uh, power generation facilities. Uh, Mr. Sullivan, I might say that um, I agree they have to be part of it. The, the part where I get nervous is when people pose that question, and the answer is clearly yes, is then that we uh, say that the United States is not going to move until China and India do. And I, I don't make that second step because I think um, uh, if we move properly, we'll be okay. If we move improperly, we're going we're gonna to create an immense number of problems for the, this society, um, let alone worldwide. So I, I, um, um, you know, I, I never do understand how things happen in, in this in the in the nation's capital. Mine, mine's a simple life in a in a rural state, um, and uh, but it just seems to me that the logic is you got to incent the technologies you want. You have to figure out a way to. Uh, uh, get part of the cost built into the uh, rate base in a way that protects the low-end uh, consumer and user. You have to end up with some willingness to say um, uh, it's going to take uh, a reasonable glide path time to get there. You've got to come up with something that is uniform across the country so the states aren't pitted against each other uh, and you end up with some rational basis. And you need to invest significant funds in how we capture carbon, that's in those clean coal technologies, and significant funds in how you're ultimately going to store it. And the issue that nobody's talked about today that I want to make sure gets on the table is, is the federal government's got to own, at some point, the liability. I've seen proposals where you're going to shift the long-term liability for CO2 to the states. And um, if you thought you had a mutiny with the Real ID Act, uh, the states are really <laughs> going to come off the wall if you say, um, once this is injected, uh, states, uh, you own that, uh, because ultimately, um, the, if we're talking about trying to sequester something for a couple hundred years, the liability for that, really the only place that that can rest is with the federal government, not with the individual states. And I would just like to make sure I add to my comment, because it was quick to the point that absolutely not, I believe that wholeheartedly, but I do share the governor's view that does not mean that my company or this industry or this country ought to sit back and do nothing if those others don't join us, that would be the wrong approach. But what we as a society need to then understand is that we, often by ourselves, can't fix this. So if you want to add, you know, you pick the number, four, five, seven, ten, twenty trillion dollars to the U.S. economy, and you haven't moved the global warming needle a, a, a nano inch, then that's a society debate that, for better or worse, you're all elected to make those decisions, and uh, with all trust and confidence, we believe you'll make solid and reasonable decisions in, in that light. Anybody else? All righty. Gentlemen. I'm out of time. You, you can ask another question. <coughs> okay. Well, I got a question for you, Mr. Morris. Uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm concerned about the potential impact of requiring new technologies on the rates that our constituents pay for electricity. Can you tell me what the best way to prevent prices from skyrocketing would be under a, a scenario where the government requires new technology for carbon capture or cap and trade? Congressman, what I would offer is that uh, a carbon-controlled uh, uh, coal-based power plant 
at, in the long run is going to be much more cost effective for my customers at Public Service of Oklahoma as well as the customers that we serve across this country because the other option is to go forward with a much larger renewable standard which is considerably more expensive than a carbon controlled coal plant or we lean on either new nuclear which we are now beginning to see equally uh, high prices. It won't be so cheap to meter. It will be quite expensive. Uh, or we, we lean to natural gas, which, which you know even in Oklahoma, a very major gas producing state, as is the governor's, we're an 18, 19 trillion foot supply. If we start running gas plants or build nothing but gas plants, we'll be at a 24, 27 trillion demand. We import less than 1 trillion feet of LNG, and I don't see that growing any time and we import three or four trillion feet from Canada which will continue to be reduced as they meet the successor to the Kyoto Protocol because they won't meet that now. So the real cost if we don't do this will be skyrocketing natural gas power plants. Thank you, gentleman's Mr. time has expired. Gen I apologize. Sir. Gentleman's no problem. Time has expired. Sorry. Um, gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenau. Thank you. Um, I'm curious uh, as to your reflections on underground coal gasification. Um, technology, I'm, I've been intrigued with uh, what I have uh, heard about the conversion of deep, unminable coal into syngas, and then used, that can be used to produce uh, almost, I guess, any uh, uh, hydrocarbon fuel or petrochemicals, lots of applications for that. But um, it appears to be very clean and easy to capture and sequester the carbon in the spent seam after you remove the syngas. Um, technically, theoretically, uh, it would appear to have tremendous uh, potential. Uh, do any of you gentlemen have experience with that and have some observations that you might share with the committee? Um, Mr. Chairman, Congressman, um, both in my life as a private lawyer before I got into this um, less respectable line of work um, and, uh, and my experience as governor. Being uh, a witness? Uh, uh, no. <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> the, uh, I, um, I had clients who did uh, underground coal gasification, and the, the technology has come a long way because the question is how do you control the reaction underground and your capacity to characterize the formation with reliability so that, that you know the CO2 stays and you get the gas. The potential for uh, this to be a remarkably viable long-term source of energy for this country is amazing. There, there are immense reserves. Uh, in our state, we characterize anything under, 3, 000, uh, under more than 3,000 feet deep as qualifying. And it is, um, the reserve is, is extensive. Again, um, the problem with the formations are is that, is that coal has all of these fractures and fissures. And so you have a lot of money. It's not unlike um, trying to make sure the CO2 stays down in a, in a cavity. You have a lot of money invested in characterizing the formation so that you can, with reliability, predict your capacity to control the gasification process as well as where the uh, off gases are going to go. But it is one of those things that, that I would encourage the committee to think about. Um, again, if you want to advance the rate at which the private sector pursues the development of those technologies, the way you do that is to set up some form of a tax credit that is essentially technology neutral and allows them to say, okay, I mean, Shell has an approach that they like on gasification. I know a number of other companies have different technologies that, that, are, that they'd like to try, but right now, um, the, 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 the assured price for natural gas is not sufficient for them to justify that long-term investment. But it is, I think it, it is one of those things, and, and I, think you're, you're, you, uh, I think you've hit upon one of the real nuggets for this country, um, notwithstanding that I may have some bias since we have a lot of that resource, but, but it really is there, and it allows you to have that, that reaction take place in a contained environment. Thank you, Governor. Other comments? Well, I, I 
only have a familiarity with it based on reports and talking with some researchers in the field. Uh, and I think the governor has identified uh, one of the first issues, which is controlling the uh, uh, the conversion process. Uh, another issue that's a challenge is uh, uh, dealing with the combustion products. Uh, a lot of these coal seams uh, have groundwater that is flowing through them, and uh, that groundwater. Uh, once you've you've uh, taken a an area and and, and su subjected it to the gasification pro process, you're going to have a lot of byproducts. Uh, those byproducts may have a lot of uh, complicated and uh, rather unfriendly uh, chemical compounds associated with them, and you have to have a plan for managing the potential intersection between that groundwater and all these combustion byproducts. These things are not necessarily impossible to solve, but they will require energy, they will require dollars. Um, this is a concept that's worth looking at, worth researching. It's probably a couple of decades behind the surface gasification technologies that are commercially proven today, though. If I may just add, I think the governor did a great characterization. I think David also uh, reflected on some of the challenges. Uh, we are involved in some of this preliminary work. Uh, the country of Brazil is looking at doing this, as well as some other countries in Eastern Europe. It has a great deal of promise. There are substantial needs, which I think are similar to the sequestration storage issue of how do you characterize, how do you monitor, how do you avoid unintended consequences to groundwater or other things in the area that have to be dealt with. So again, uh, the things that are being done around carbon sequestration and storage actually will have benefits, just as the things in oil reservoir mapping have had benefits for storage characterization. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, um, I would hope that there may be an opportunity for us at a subsequent hearing to explore this in greater detail. Um, I think there are actually other applications that are taking place uh, in North America, in Canada. Um, there has been, as Mr. Bauer mentioned, uh, some experience in Central Europe. Um, um, I think it holds great promise. It's something that isn't commonly talked about and looks like it could marry a number of uh, the problems and opportunities together. And if it would be possible, I would appreciate your we, consideration. We do that. Uh, I, I, to the gentleman from Oregon, obviously coal is the biggest problem. So we have to explore all of these uh, potential solutions. So Thank it, will you. Be, it will be done. Thank you. Um, <coughs> I just want, I'm going to recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver, but you should know that uh, we promised uh, Governor Friedenthal that he could leave at 12 o'clock, and it's three minutes of 12. Um, and so uh, he made this request long ago. So if you have any questions for the governor, uh, you've got three minutes on the clock for him, and uh, we thank you, Governor, for being here. Your testimony has been excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Missouri. Thank you, uh, Governor. Um, thank you very much for uh, being here, and, and your uh, responses have been uh, uh, very uh, helpful. Uh, you know, to some degree, you you do understand what it's like to be on this side of the of the table. So I appreciate your, your concerns. I don't I don't have any uh, questions for the governor uh, necessarily. I, I, I'm interested in in how we you know successfully sequester. Uh, but, but it seems to me that if you turn loose the American ingenuity, we can solve a lot of those problems. The, the, one, the one problem I'm not sure is going to be uh, resolved as easily is the issue with China and India, and to a lesser degree Southeast Asia, uh, including Indonesia. Um, if we are going to end up paying higher prices um, in Walmart uh, by imposing some kind of tariff or, um, you know, if, 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 we, if our incentive is to, call, to, to force the Chinese and uh, the Indians to, to um, uh, use more money, pay more money uh, to satisfy us, and if we don't want to pay more at Walmart and Target, what, what in the world are we? I mean, are, are we going to do? I mean, we, as I think we're learning, nations don't obey us well, and and so, I mean, just saying you better 
uh, is not going to work. So what, what are we going to do? Congressman, if I might, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, President Ed Hill, and our company, American Electric Power, have put forth, now with the support of the AFL-CIO, UAW, the mine workers, the boiler makers, uh, the concept of creating a World Trade Organization compliant tariff requirement for those products which we would import for those nations that have not addressed the issue of global warming. Because again, what, what, we're trying to, what we're trying to address ourselves here is the issue of global warming, not U.S. warming. If in fact you are concerned about the climate uh, process that may or may not unfold as time goes forward if we do nothing about this as a world. So the notion that there may be an additional cost for a good at the Walmart store or the Target store is a societal reality for the globe. Believing and, and dictating to those countries what they ought to do will not work. We, uh, to your point, we now know that in any one of a number of uh, demonstrations. But this concept, again, w w the, the way it works under the World Trade Organization is once you have required a carbon program on U.S. manufacturers, and it's been in place for a half a decade, you can then require the same kind of program on international uh, manufacturers who would export goods to this country. And, and that's the plan, and quite honestly, it's gaining very reasonable support. Both the Bingham and uh, Specter bill have that in it. The Lieberman-Warner uh, bill has a sketch of that in it. Uh, we have heard, at least, from the principal committee under uh, Chairman Dingell and uh, Committee Chair Boucher uh, that they're very much in support of that concept as we go forward. That is one way to go about doing that. The thing that would worry me even more about that as we go forward, however, would be how would we verify that those programs are, in fact, being followed. And so with this particular piece, we don't need to be as concerned about what they are or are not doing there. We just know that that's an economic driver that will eventually cause them to move in the right direction, as will their own populations. I think the New York Times this weekend had an excellent piece on the, on the general feeling about the population in China in particular. But you're right to point out Indonesia, Brazil, there are many other countries involved. Thank you. If I could just comment, there, there is an opportunity for a virtuous circle uh, here. Uh, NRDC has an office in Beijing. We now have nine people on staff there. And uh, we spend most of our time analyzing uh, the uh, Chinese energy economy and pointing out the bottlenecks to growth that are represented by the inefficient processes in industrial production and in power production and trying to make the case to Chinese officials that by adopting better standards for end use efficiency, better standards for production efficiency, they can actually have more dollars go to value added products and fewer dollars go to BTUs that are moving around in the economy. And the adoption of the kind of program that uh, Mike Morris just described by the United States could be just the added extra kicker to kind of help the Chinese officials to make this happen. Because right now you have tension between the national government, a lot of the officials mm -hmm get this problem. They understand it. But the provincial governments are making money hand over fist, building power plants to feed the power-hungry east coast of China. And so you have, you don't have a system that is necessarily in the best interests of China as a nation, but it's, it's certainly in the short-term interests of a lot of provincial officials who are, who are making lots of money for their, their provinces uh, through this very rapid explosion of coal-fired power plants that actually don't have to be built if the, if the Chinese economy uh, uh, had efficiency programs, and we're trying to get those done. The politics are challenging, uh, and obviously as a U.S.-based environmental organization, we have limited capacity to make those changes, but with supporting policies in the United States that essentially give another reason for the Chinese to pay more attention to these opportunities, we think we could make it happen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, do any of the other members have any, does anyone have a final question they'd like to ask Mr. Inslee, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blumenauer? Um, Mr. Cleaver, do you have any? Uh, no, thank you. Great. Um, well, let's do this. Let's, let's in, um, let us in uh, reverse order um, ask each of you uh, to give us your one-minute 
summation of what it is that you want the committee to remember from your testimony uh, uh, as we deal with this energy bill over the next uh, 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 month or so we'll, there's going to be a, an, a, a, a city that will turn its attention to this climate change issue and cap and trade legislation so uh, tell us what it is that you want us to remember as we're moving forward we'll begin with you mr. Dalton Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first off, I'd uh, like to point out that the increased efficiency and integrated testing at full scale is important uh, for these technologies relatively quickly, even before full scale commercial uh, uh, installation. The R&D needs to move forward, uh, and the demonstration and deployment needs to move forward rapidly. Increased thermodynamic efficiency of pulverized coal, increased efficiency and reliability of intergas gasification uh, that matches the combustion, uh, the, the uh, CO2 capture is very important, as well as improved technologies for CO2 capture. Reliable uh, technologies for CO2 storage and mechanisms to deal with the financial and technical risks in that storage are important. But a full portfolio is really required. Is required. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sussman. that we're on right now, I, I think it's a high likelihood that we're just not going to see widespread deployment of CCS uh, before 2030 at the earliest. And uh, I would submit that that is too late. What we, what we need uh, is we need a national implementation date. Uh, we would say that that implementation date is 2016. Others might say that it's 2020. Uh, and we need to send a very clear message to uh, developers and builders of coal plants uh, that any new coal plant would be expected to have CCS in place uh, by that national implementation date. Uh, then we need to address the cost differential uh, and the potential impacts on electricity price increases and as we outline in our report, uh, there is simply no alternative but to subsidize CCS until the price of carbon uh, gets to a level that would incentivize CCS uh, in the market. And that, I think, uh, means a national expenditure, in our view, of somewhere between 35 and $40 billion uh, to make CCS cost competitive uh, until around 2030 when it should be cost competitive under a cap and trade system. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hawkins. Mr. Chairman, every month of delay hurts us in attacking the climate problem and raises the cost of doing so. Every month, 10 new coal plants are, are started up somewhere around the world. Each one of those coal plants is going to operate for 60 years or more, and we have no reliable prospect that any of the CO2 from those coal plants will be captured because they're not being designed uh, to allow that. Uh, maybe it'll happen, but we can't count on it. So, it's critical that the United States act, and this Congress uh, has the ability to act. We think the policy package that I outlined is the one that uh, can make a huge change, and that's a cap and trade program, and then focused performance standards for making sure that the next coal plants that get built in the United States capture their carbon. There's been a lot of talk about uh, proving things out, but uh, the way we'll prove this out is by operating these things at scale. We get the learning by doing. These technologies are all commercially proven in pieces. We need to put them together, and we need a policy package to make it happen. Thank you, Mr. Hawkins. Uh, Mr. Bauer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would have a few points. Carbon capture and storage is achievable. It's realistic. And uh, the R&D and large-scale demonstration that will take place over the next 15 years will fully make that a very feasible technology. There needs investment in the R&D. There needs regulatory certainty for the investment to come from the private sector as well, as well as the actual implementation, as Mr. Moore spoke to. I think it's also important to recognize that the energy industry is the private sector. The U.S. government does not make electricity, although we do have the uh, hydropower and some uh, TVA and like that, yet the majority is private sector. So 
things that make it for the private sector, the signals both uh, regulatory and otherwise that make it work are very essential in this. Uh, one thing we did not talk about today is 60 percent of electricity demand is residential and commercial buildings. Uh, the ability to reduce demand or slow the growth in demand, not by slowing building but by higher standards of building codes, is a very important tool that is often undervalued but yet substantially possible. I think that's worth looking at. And then lastly, I think that uh, the committee has already indicated a recognition that our domestic resource coal and fossil fuels have to be an essential component, so we're talking about how do we do that realistically and, and economically. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Bauer. Mr. Morris. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It seems to me that uh, it's inevitable that we're going to work to a cap-and-trade program, and, and we would argue that it needs to be an economy-wide cap-and-trade program, that it needs to have timelines and reduction schedules that are realistic and, in fact, achievable. We would believe that uh, credits ought to be allocated to those who will invest the capital to make a difference in the environment rather than auctioned uh, so that those who buy them can make money by the positions that they have taken. Uh, we obviously believe that the global nature of it needs to be addressed and cannot be uh, denied or ignored. Uh, we obviously believe that we also ought to have a price cap on those credits so that if you need to create more or you need to buy more, at least in the early go, we know what that cost is so that the U.S. economy can digest and adjust to that cost, whatever it might be. And lastly, uh, we think that those who have implemented early action and taken voluntary steps ought to get credits and bonus recognition for the steps that they've taken because we, in fact, uh, in a voluntary nature, have made a huge difference in the CO2 footprint of our company alone, and many of my colleagues have done that as well. Thanks very much for the time to be here and share some ideas. Thank you, Mr. Morris, very much. Um, uh, Congresswoman uh, Princess Sandlin has arrived, and so uh, this uh, hearing is now officially in overtime as we recognize her for a round of questions. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the witnesses uh, for their patience. I did want to explore just a couple of issues quickly. And if I could start with you, Mr. Bauer, you had talked about um, coal and biomass. And uh, are you working with and, and familiar with the DO, the Department of Energy's workshops that they've done? They've set up by region. And in South Dakota, for example, within our region, one of our land-grant universities is sort of leading uh, these workshops to help calculate the availability and sustainability of feedstocks like switchgrass, of the sustainability of biomass by region. Uh, that would then, of course, assist as it relates to those regional calculations and where the coal-fired facilities are located. Uh, and maybe you could just elaborate a little bit on the IGCC technology as it relates to integrating biomass with the coal plant. Uh, yes, ma'am, Congresswoman. Uh, I am familiar with that. In fact, uh, there are two entities that implement that for DOE, the Golden Office out of Denver and an ETL, where I am, at Pittsburgh Morgantown. Uh, we are operating mostly in the eastern half of the United States, Denver, Texas, you would expect the western half. But I am familiar with the, the process of working with the land-grant colleges and the state energy boards about uh, funding to look at renewables and the, the source. Going specifically, the, the issue about biomass with coal is an issue, just like biomass anywhere, is, is there a sufficient amount of biomass in a reasonable radius of transport to make it happen? That's what I mentioned, so, uh, switchgrass and those kind of crops that have a potential to add to it. Gasifiers can and do, and Bougainham over the Netherlands does about 30 percent, that's a wood waste biomass that they use over there with coal to produce electricity. They are looking at building another plant and actually capturing the CO2 and storing it, store sequestration. So it is doable. There are challenges because of the characterization of the biomass and the different kinds of coals, and those are all technologically able to be addressed, but they aren't being done regularly, so there will be R&D issues that have to be done with in the process of implementation. Do you think one of the other challenges, um, and I guess maybe not a challenge, but the importance of uh, facilitating getting these measurements and calculations because of the issue of biomass for electricity generation and biomass for transportation biofuel production. I mean, do you, do you anticipate some sort of tension developing there if we don't get these calculations and measurements so we can adequately define what are reachable goals on both the electricity sector and the transportation sector side of, of the equation here? Yeah, I, I believe there is, there is a, a realistic marketplace 
just like there is today. Natural gas is one of the fuels that cuts across all marketplaces of use. Uh, we've lost uh, fertilizer industry offshore. We're importing natural gas from other countries in the form of fertilizer today. Uh, we lost chemical production because we use natural gas for power generation and other things. So the price in the marketplace drives that. And the same thing will be true on competition for biomass for both uh, biofuels direct conversion and thermal conversion of biomass and coal together to perform uh, coal biomass liquids for transportation. I think the economics of the market will work and sort that out and also will drive towards certain crops besides food crops as sources for rapid growth of biomass. Uh, thank you. And then one final question which anyone can uh, uh, additionally respond to either the issue of the biomass uh, in the coal-fired facilities and what your uh, company or, or what the sector uh, is doing to respond to that. But Mr. Hawkins, specifically, when you set forth the three-part policy package uh, for a comprehensive cap-and-trade system, where do you see American agric agriculture uh, playing a role in that system? Because when we traveled to Europe uh, earlier this year, they don't include agriculture uh, in their cap-and-trade system, and I think that they made a mistake and setting up their system not to. And I think there's great potential for agriculture and certain farming practices and grazing practices uh, to play a role in helping store carbon, especially as we transition to these new technologies. So your thoughts on that, please. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. Um, we think that uh, agriculture has an important role to play, and we think it would be important to design a cap and trade program to create incentives for practices that will uh, reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions and enhance uh, the storage of, uh, of carbon in soils, for example. Uh, our view is the best way to do that is to have a portion of the allowances that uh, will be administered under any cap and trade program be available on uh, basically a, a best bid basis for projects and programs in the agricultural sector uh, that will reduce these, uh, these uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And, and that way, uh, American agriculture could be incented by being able to receive either allowances directly or the proceeds from allowance sales in order to support these programs. Two of the uh, programs that we've used in our voluntary nature of reducing our carbon footprint uh, drive themselves specifically to agriculture. One is the whole notion of methane capture, uh, which, as you know, has a much more beneficial environmental global warming impact. Uh, farmers create uh, through uh, contracting with firms that do that work, uh, particularly in the manure uh, side of the business, the capture of the methane, create credits, which we in turn would purchase and put in our bank to make certain that we have credits uh, to uh, take against our own global warming footprint, as well as no-till farming, which is uh, another breakthrough undertaking. So including the entirety of the U.S. economy and the entirety of the U.S. creativity uh, is what is going to be needed if we're going to be successful in this endeavor. Great. The uh, gentlelady's time has expired, and all time for this hearing has expired as well. Um, this is going to be uh, the first of many, many hearings that we're going to have uh, on uh, this and related subjects um, that uh, uh, will result in uh, legislation passing uh, that will begin to change the relationship between the United States uh, and greenhouse gases. We thank you very much for uh, your participation today.